Hi, my name is Amber. Welcome to The Courageous Church. And I'm Tavora. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us, especially if this is your first time to be here. We want you to find your purpose here, and you can do so by joining our dream team. You don't have to be here long to know that our dream team is what makes Courageous so special. The dream team is made up of passionate people who found their place making a difference in areas working with kids, students, music, production, and so much more. And joining the dream team, all you need to do is go through Growth Track, which has three easy steps. Step two of Growth Track is today at 11, and anyone can jump right in. Also, here at TCC, we're passionate about serving people in our community. That's why we decided to partner with the organization Ambassadors for Children, whose mission focuses on providing new clothing for foster families. They'll be bringing their donation truck next week, and we need your help to stuff the truck. On your way out, you'll notice a bag on your windshield with instructions and a list of items. Just be sure to bring the bag of items with you next week. We can't wait to bless families this holiday season. Oh, and speaking of missions, our missions team is going back to the Dominican Republic in the summer of 2018. If you're interested, go online for more information. If you are in need of a holiday gift idea, our coffee bar is now selling gift cards. Head to the coffee bar to get this gift for a loved one so they can stock up on their caffeine fix or courageous merchandise. You can keep up with everything Courageous on social media. Make sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you don't miss a thing. Thank you so much for being with us today. We believe you're here for a reason. Let us know if we can help you out with anything while you're here. We hope you have a great week. Jesus, a big hand this morning. He is good, and he's the reason we're here today, and I'm glad that you're here. Uh, before I begin, I want to say, wow to Mitch and Brandon speaking last week. They both did amazing. Would you give it up one more time for Mitch and Brandon and all they did? Great job delivering the word of God. So thankful for that. And so uh, last weekend, Renee and I were visiting family and I was visiting one of the larger churches in America getting ideas. And many times you become more creative and more thoughtful about something when you're not surrounded by it. And so that helped us kind of get some perspective on some of the things we need to be doing. And so I'm glad that you're here. And today is week three of our series, Unnecessary Roughness. And the key verse that we're using is this from Ephesians 4.32. Instead, instead of what? Well, instead of losing it, instead of, of, of losing your temper, I'm going to talk about taming your temper today. Instead of that, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you, Ephesians 4.32. And so the goal of this series is to unleash the power of gentleness in our lives, all right? Now, all of us tend to struggle with aggress aggressive relational behavior. We will do things with those that we love and those that we trust, and we'll expose ourselves uh, emotionally in ways that we would never do anywhere else. And, and, and those close relationships open us up, like when I got married, I finally realized or suddenly realized, hey, I'm selfish. I didn't know that. And then when I had kids, I realized, hey, I have a temper and I don't have much patience. And so those close relationships always open up that kind of stuff in your life. And so there's, a, there's an importance to that that I, I want to talk about. But in, in preparing it, I, I, I was talking to Renee. I was like, honey, I'm trying to think of some illustrations for this sermon, um, and I don't have any right yet. And she said, well, what's it about? I said, well, it's about taming your temper. And she goes, oh, no, 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 I wrote it down. I remember how the conversation went. I said, I said uh, she said, what's it about? I said, I don't want to talk about it. She said, what do you mean? I said, it's about taming your temp temper. She goes, oh, you don't have any illustrations, huh? And I said, this conversation is over. Like, uh, you know, we all have moments when we just wish we could have a do-over. And if, if, we could, if there was an official, like an NFL official running around our house, There'd be moments when the yellow flag would be thrown, like penalty, unnecessary roughness, five yards, go back to the bedroom, come out, try that again. Like that's what would happen, you know? But, uh, uh, you know, there, there, there's strength. There's strength to being kind. There's strength to being gentle. The Bible tells us in Matthew 5, 5, that, that the meek, the humble in heart, will inherit the earth. Like there is strength that comes from being gentle, being, being meek. Whatever happened to the phrase, gentlemen? Now, I know it's made a little bit of a comeback for, like, beard care, gentleman's guide, you know, that kind of stuff. But, but like, the, the concept of gentleman has largely been forgotten. And so I went back and looked at all the old etiquette guides from, like, the 1800s. And here's, here's what gentlemen need to be able to do, okay? Gentlemen need to be able to ride, shoot, to fence, like, swing that fence, to box, to swim, to row, 
and to dance. I got that one covered. All right. Like it says, it says he should be graceful if attacked by ruffians. I love that word. Oh, you ruffian. If attacked by ruffians, he should be able to defend himself and also defend women from their insults. That's from the Rules of Etiquette and Home Culture, 1866. Another guide said a gentleman uh, needs to never scratch his head, never pick your teeth, never clean your nails, or worst of all, pick your nose in company. In all these things, you are most disgusting. Spit as little as possible and never upon the floor. And if you're going into the presence of ladies, beware of onions, spirits, and tobacco. Yes, that's a little bit of a guide for gentlemen. But, but gentlemen, being a gentle person, being a gentle man is um, something more than just not spitting, not scratching, not picking. Um, there, there's, there's more to it than that, and we're going to talk about it. Like, in, in the phrase, um, gentle man is not just a phrase used, but in Congress, they use the phrase gentlewoman. We would like to recognize the gentlewoman from Maine to come and speak now. Like, gentlewoman means that if you look it up, it's like somebody from a good family, somebody with, 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 with good manners, good etiquette, whatever. But understand something, the average gentleman loses his temper like six times a week. So you take one day off, but you're losing your temper six times a week. And the average gentlewoman loses her temper about every other day. And so uh, most people, if you're normal, you're losing your temper temper at some point. And here's what's unique about losing your temper. Women get angry at people. Well, I just, I just can't. Oh, look at her. I can't believe she looked at me that way. And men get mad at things like, this old carburetor, dang old, I'm going to cut the I'm going to touch I'm going to double that jet. I'm going to change out them springs. I'm going to dine flow. <laughs> like men, men get mad at things. Remember Christmas is coming up. Remember uh, a Christmas story where, where the kid who wanted the Red Ryder BB gun, his dad always fought the furnace and he gets so mad at that furnace. That, that's how men are. We'll get mad at things, but women get mad at people. And you're more likely to express your anger and lose your temper in your home amongst your people than anywhere else. And so I want to look at an example of somebody that missed out because they lost their temper, okay? And this is Moses. Moses led God's children. A lot of the Old Testament has Moses mentioned, and, and, and Moses uh, received so much of it from God and actually penned portions of the Old Testament. And so I'm going to take it in Numbers chapter 20, verse 7, okay? And this is God and Moses talking. Here's what it says. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, gather the people together, and I want you, they, they, here's the problem. There was a need. They were thirsty. They were, they were, they were going to, they were going to, uh, uh, dehydrate, they didn't get some water. And so the people were like, we need water. So God said, uh, take the staff, you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together, speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You'll bring water out of the rock for the community so they, can, they and their livestock can drink. So God assured Moses of a miracle and told him what to do, go speak to the rock. So it says in verse nine, Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him, he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, we must bring you water out of this rock. Like, and Moses is good and ticked off. He's name-calling. You rebels, you bunch of no goods. Like, he, he's, he's upset, clearly. Then Moses raised his arm and stuck, struck the rock twice, boom, boom, with the staff, and water gushed out. That's not what God said. God said, speak to it, Moses. And Moses, in a fit of anger and frustration, losing his temper. And that was one of Moses' big problems. Moses got mad at a uh, Egyptian and murdered him in cold blood. Moses over, and there were times when it was good, like Moses got angry at Pharaoh and God was in that. Moses had anger in his life a lot. Anger in itself is not a sin, but when you lose your temper and when you lose control, that ends up creating all kinds of problems. And so now Moses has done something directly uh, opposed to what God said to do, okay? So he struck, and got, but God honored it because the people needed it. So he struck the rock and water came out to, to give water to the people in the wilderness. Verse 12, but the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. All of that lets me know 
that if I get ahead of God and I think I've got more strength than God to work in my life, that I might miss out on some good things. Does anybody want to miss out on what God has for them? I don't, and I know you don't either. And so um, here's what Proverbs 16, 32 says. And a lot of the scriptures I'm going to give you today are from the book of Proverbs because it's practical, applicable wisdom for this issue in many of our lives. It says, Proverbs 16, 32, it says, better to be patient than powerful. Moses, it would have been better for you to be patient than people say, woo, look at Moses. That man can wield a stick. Rather than say, wow, look what God did through Moses, they're saying, wow, look what Moses' anger and authority accomplished. Understand, that's a difference in temper. It, it still can result in the same thing short term, but long term, it presented a huge problem because Moses couldn't go where God had intended for him to go. It says in Proverbs 16, 32, better to be patient than powerful. Say that, better to be patient than powerful. Wow, that doesn't, like who wants that? I'd much rather, no, that's what the Bible says, better be patient than powerful, better to have self-control than to conquer a city. So speaking of conquering cities, there was a man who lived long ago named Alexander the Great. He ruled much of the known world at the time. And one day in a fit of rage, he struck one of his most prominent and loved generals and killed him and was so frustrated. He was also his best friend. He was so frustrated, he cried out, I've conquered the world, but I can't even conquer my own soul. Like, how do you get a grip on your temper? Because you can be successful in a bunch of different areas, but if in your heart you can't control what bubbles out of it, there's a problem, all right? Like that spark of, that spark of anger, it doesn't stop with you. Like I have a friend who pastors in Northern California where the wildfires just destroyed whole neighborhoods. And it just started with a small thing, but I watched him go into his community and look at, at homes from people in his church and family. They were just completely leveled because one little spark can spread so fast. That's what anger does. And so Proverbs gives us practical wisdom. There's three things you need to do when you're, feeling that coming on of, of temper and anger and you're, you're going to commit the penalty of unnecessary roughness, we got we to gotta do two, two, three things. You got to remember the results of your anger. What does this accomplish? Does it accomplish anything? You got to take a moment and reflect on it before you react like, is this the right move to make? And then, and then once you've done that, you just sometimes have to restrain yourself and say, no, I'm not going there, okay? So I want to break those down further. The first one was remember the results, okay? Remember the results of your temper. When I have lost my temper, I have broken things. Listen, I tool around with fixing stuff, and I can fix a lot of things, but there's some stuff that's next level I can't fix. And my, my, <laughs> my, my grandpa, who was not very uh, skilled, he always said, the best repair tool is a hammer. Like you can't, you can't just take a hammer to things when they're not working out. And so here's what the Bible says about, about the results of, of, of losing your temper. It says an angry person starts fights, Proverbs 29, 22. An angry person starts fights. A hot-tempered person commits all kinds of sin. Listen, you have to know where you're at. If you've ever boiled water, there's something unique about water. You can put it on the stove and it can be very, very hot. But until it crosses the threshold to 212 degrees, it will not boil. At 211 degrees, water is just hot and it can hurt you, but at 212, it boils. Listen, you've got to understand that there is a boiling point for everybody, and you gotta know yourself. You gotta know what, what would possibly put you in a bad spot, a bad state of mind, and avoid that. And so, and so remember the results of blowing up. It didn't probably go so well. Um, I went on the internet hoping to find a great video of examples of tinter tantrums, and there was just so much cussing, I couldn't use it. But there were literally kids going into like Dollar General, uh, so you know it was in Arkansas, and uh, going, into, going into various stores and throwing these temper tantrums and going up to the shelves and throwing stuff off the shelves. And the mother was walking behind him saying, now Ethan, now Ethan. Listen, like, the, wow. Like, it, it's, it, it, it creates a lot of destruction, okay? But the Bible says this, when, when that feeling comes on you to just flip out and, 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 and lose your temper, be unnecessarily rough. Proverbs 15 and 1 says, a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh 
Words make tempers flare. You can choose to make it bigger or smaller, and the more gentle you are, it can cause the anger that's building to dissipate. But if something's already at 211 degrees, you're like, let's throw another coal on the fire. Let's make this bigger. At 212, you're going to get boiling. And that's when a mess happens. Like, anger causes you to make mistakes. Losing your temper, it makes you do foolish things. When you lose your temper, you're always going to lose. Like, it's losing your temper. You're losing something along the way. Proverbs 11.29 says, whoever brings ruin on their family will inherit only when you'll have nothing left and the fool will be the servant to the wise. Anger starts first in the family and it can cause a devastating effect. A survey was done of children nine to 12 years of age and they asked them two questions. What do you like most about your mother and what do you dislike the most about your mother? What do you like the most about your mom? What do you dislike the most about your mom? The first question, what you like the most is different but the second question was pretty consistent. It was almost unanimous. Almost every child used the phrase, I, I, I hate it when she screams. I hate her yelling. I hate her screaming. Why do we scream? Why do we lose control? Because it works. Like, there's, there's a short-term effect. You can get what you want by losing your temper. But, but, and psychologists know this, but when you yell and get angry at somebody, um, most of the time, people will comply just out of fear, but in the long run, you lose because anger alienates. It divides, it separates. And so in the long run, you can lose the relationship. And so remember the results. If I, if I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to wound. I don't want to stop relationship. I'm going to, I'm going to remember that a gentle answer turns away wrath and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to forget that this this moment has long-term effects, and so it all matters, okay? Second point is this. Say number two. Say it with me. Reflect before reacting. Stop. Wait a minute. Think about it. So, so you can just kind of take a moment. Like one of the greatest remedies for anger is just delaying. I might be mad about something now, but if I take 30 minutes and wait, I can bring it together. But if I return fire as quick as I get fire, I'm going to fire back, and it's going to feel great in the short term. But in the long term, it has problems. Here's what Proverbs 29, 11 says. Fools give full vent, okay? You're running your AC on max, cranking up the fan in your car. You got all, a full vent. Fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. You got to hold your anger. Count it down. Stop. Reflect before reacting. Anger is a choice. Losing your temper is a choice. Unnecessary roughness is a choice. And you've got to want to control it. Have you ever been in an argument with your husband, boss, wife, father, mother, sister, brother? And they're yelling and arguing and all of a sudden the phone rings and you're like, I don't care. And, Hello, Padgett Residence, how can we help you? Like, it's a choice. You can shut it down if you want to. And so we control what we want to control. Now, that was a cell phone. That wasn't a wall phone, just in case you're wondering what I was answering right there, all right? So, so the Bible says in Proverbs 12 and 16 that a fool is quick-tempered. We think quick is better, right? We think quick and more responsive and reactive is better, right? But no, a fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. Smart people ignore insults. And so the converse of that would be true, that, that not smart people hear everything and respond to everything. Like, like if you put, a, I had an had Italian grandmother named Mafala, Mafala, Blancato, Talata. My grandma Mafalda, Blancata, Talata. Blancato, Talata. She went by Sue, but uh, she, would, she would make spaghetti. She'd call it noodles and gravy, which was spaghetti. And she had this huge pot for, for, for noodles, right? For pasta. And she would, she would get that on the stove, and it would, take, it would take quite some time to boil because it was so big. But you want to make a little macaroni and cheese for yourself on your budget, you know? Go down to Aldi's, pay 23 cents for a box of macaroni and cheese, living like kings. Put a little pot on the stove. You can get it boiling in minutes because a little pot boils fast, but a big pot takes a while. Are you a little person or a big person? 
Like what, what sets you off? Can you, can you absorb some heat and not flip out? Can you, can, you, can you find a way to bring it down? Like maturity is the ability to overlook the hurt. Maturity is the ability to disregard and shrug off offense, to play it down, to play it cool. I mean, Jesus was criticized unjustly so many times that he never retaliated. Look, nothing can make you mad. It's a choice that you make. It's the way you interpret things. Like, and I've said it before, you make me so mad, I'd say it to Renee. You make me so mad. No, I made myself mad. I could have walked out. I could have, I could have slipped in the yard. I could have done all kinds of things. But I blamed her for it, you know. So it's the way you respond, all right? So George Patton, the famous general who was a strategist, wrote this in his book, Principles for Managers. He wrote, never fight a battle where you don't gain anything by winning. You know, in Proverbs 19.11, a person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense, to be able to ignore. Proverbs 19.11, ignore some stuff and don't be unnecessarily rough. The Bible says this also in Proverbs 17, 27, and this is the message translation, but, but if you're smart, the one who knows much says little, but in an understanding person remains calm. The more wise you are, the more you're like, you know what, words are not required right here. So that's, that's one of the keys to anger control and seeking to understand. Walking a mile in somebody's shoes for all the racial tension, walking a mile in somebody's skin, Walking a mile in somebody else's experience will help you understand them, understand your kids, understand your wife, uh, understand the people you work with, understand what it is. Like, I didn't understand how much work it was to do some things around the house until Renee was gone and I had to do it. And now I'm like, hey, we ain't doing that. We're going to take care of this because that's a lot. I have experienced some of the things that she had to do to take care of the kids. I'm like, you know what? We just don't need to do that, boys, where I would have let it go in the past. Why? Because I've experienced the frustration that she experienced and identify with it now, okay? And so when you get angry, there can be several reasons why you get angry. But one of the biggest ones is because you're hurt. Like hurting people hurt people. And, uh, when you're, when you're hurt, you, you get angry. So understand there might be some things that you need to give to God. That's why we have small groups. That's why we have especially our freedom small groups to help us kind of look toward and look within and look toward God regarding the, the yesterdays in our life. And another reason we get angry and lose our temper and we're unnecessarily rough is because we're just, we're frustrated when nothing seems to work and, 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 and you're forced to wait when things aren't going as planned. It's like, well, I'll just create change by flipping out. It doesn't work that way. And uh, the last reason is because you're insecure. Um, a lot of times in your marriage, you think you're angry, but you're not. You're just insecure. You're trying to establish your identity. You're trying to um, make, it, uh, make it what you want it to be, and it's not going that way. Like when, when, you're, when you're threatened, when you're afraid, when you feel like your self-worth is under attack, um, and you feel backed into a corner, just like an animal that's backed into a corner, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll attack, and that's what happens. And so we think, well, they're not listening. They don't understand me. I'm losing this relationship, all of that. Listen, people that have an overactive temper are just very insecure. And uh, when you deal with those kind of things, understand the Bible says if you want to gain insight, you've got to stay calm. People who stay calm get real insight. But when you fly off the handle and start screaming, your mentality regresses to that of an eight-year-old child and you're not able to fully understand what's going on. Listen, being unnecessarily rough stunts your growth emotionally and in your relationships. And so you gotta remember that there's bad results that come from losing your temper. You gotta remember that there's negative consequences that come from losing your temper. And uh, you, gotta, you gotta reflect before you react and take a moment, cool down, count to 10, count to 100, walk around the block, whatever you gotta do so that you don't put yourself in a position of, of being unnecessarily rough. And then, and then the last point is this, you gotta, you gotta restrain your remarks, okay? The angrier you get, the freer you get with your tongue, the freer you get with your words. This is what Proverbs 21, 23 says. Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you'll stay out of trouble. When I'm angry, I feel like I'm so articulate, but I'd be mortified. Some of the fights Renee and I have had, I'd be mortified if it was played back in this room on these speakers because I sound like an idiot. Understand something. Your remarks need to be restrained. Um, have, you ever, have you ever yelled at anybody or anything and immediately regretted it? 
I'm sure you have, it happens. The Bible tells us that a gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. Harsh words and aggravated responses take the pot boiling from 2.11 to 2.12, and it starts, it starts boiling up. So the, the, the louder you talk back when you're angry and frustrated, the angrier you get. So how do you do that? Well, next time you get in one of those situations and somebody starts frustrating you, lower your voice. Where this would be your normal talking tone, and they'd say something to you, and you, you would answer and say, well, well, I'm not sure that's really the way it goes. Like you lower your voice physically, and it causes the whole thing to kind of kind of uh, uh, dissipate. But if somebody brings fire at you and you're like, ah, oh, is that what you think? Well, let me tell you something right now. Like, okay, now we're going higher. Now we're going higher, and that's when trouble comes, okay? And so um, I mean, your children are watching you. Your family's watching you. Your influence is on the line. And we don't want to damage people. And so what do you do with all that anger? Well, I can't say anything. I can't flip out. I can't do all the stuff I've been doing. What do you do? The Bible is a real book with real people with real solutions. And you can't surprise God with your prayers. You got to take that stuff and unload it on God. David did it. Like David was so mad one time. And he was frustrated rather than break the teeth of his enemies and go punch them in the mouth. He prayed this prayer. Ready? Let's pray this with me. Psalm 58 and 6. Oh Lord, break their teeth, break their teeth in their mouth, oh God. Like that's that's as real as David got. He was so angry, he was so frustrated, but he turned that frustration toward prayer, toward talking to God, toward sharing what was in his heart with God so he might actually get some insight rather than just make a mess of the situation. Are you following me? Like by sharing your frustration, anger, and those moments that make you so upset with God, it gives you an option that you don't have otherwise, which is to hear from God in that moment. And David did that. So, you know, you can go and pray like David prayed, like, Lord, I sure would like to kick them in the shins right now. Glory be to your holy name. Like you can talk to God. David did it, all right? And so turn that anger into prayer. And when you start doing that, you start emptying that out and, and just saying, God, this is what I'm frustrated with. God will some way allow that burden of that to be a little bit less. And then that part of your heart that you've confessed to him, be filled with his spirit, filled with his presence, filled with his help. That's a better way of living, okay? And so if you feel like that pot, so many times, like that old hip hop song that says, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. You got to go back a long way to pick that one up, all right? But like, if you feel that way, like I'm just on the, I'm at 211 degrees and one more degree, I'm going to boil. Understand, you're just filled up. You've not emptied out anything to God. You've not asked God to help. You've not confessed it to God. And that's why you're wound so tight. That's why you're so filled with the pressure. God wants to take that stuff out of your heart and release his peace and his direction, his truth, his strength, his help. He wants to give you that stuff. That's what makes, that's what makes insight come. That's where wisdom comes from, the presence and spirit of God. And so God will then not just deal with the issue, but he'll take you to the root. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit working in your life. It'll go to the root of things and, and bring out real issues that might be causing that. Like, God wants to heal the hurts that cause us to hurt others with his love. And I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to hurt the ones I love. And so God wants to replace that hurt with his love. Um, Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Not the peace that the world gives. I give you peace that's different than any other peace. And when, when you realize that God's loving you and he's, he, he's worthy to be trusted by you, when you realize that, that you're loved by him, it's a freeing thing. And what you're turning toward others, you can turn toward God and he'll, he'll help you. Like, and, 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 and like I said, insecurity is a big part of it. If you know that God loves you so much and not just loves you but likes you, if you know that God is crazy about you, then you can understand that I can share that with him and he's not going to push me away. He's gonna pull me close. Like, you're not feeling threatened by your wife or your husband because at that point, your value has come from God and you're in a different spot. We don't need to be unnecessarily rough. We need to have peace that passes understanding and have a spirit of gentleness in our life that is trusting, believing, and hoping in God. And that's what God wants to do with your life. And so, 
I know that there's probably some tension. There's probably some tension right now in families and amongst friends, children and parents, parents and uh, kids and husbands and wives. And Understand something, that, that this message is not for you to point the finger. It's for you to turn your heart toward God. Like, we have to all realize that we've all come short and we've all missed the mark. We've all fallen short of the best intentions God has for us, his glory. We've all fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible says. That means that the help that we need doesn't come from trying harder, doing better, making stronger commitments. It means that we turn toward Jesus, trusting him more, believing in more, and hoping in him more. That is where help comes from. And so this morning, I am asking you to take your eyes off of the behavior that you're a little bit ashamed of and turn those same eyes to Jesus Christ and speak to him and say, Lord, I get so frustrated. I get so upset. I don't even know where it comes from. I hear myself talk and I don't know, I don't know why I'm saying this. I don't know where all this comes from. And God, I'm giving that to you today. Heal my heart. Change my mind. Remove the root of this anger, frustration, insecurity, all these things that are causing me to blow up over and over again. And Father, let your peace come into my life and lead me by your Holy Spirit. That needs to be our prayer today. And so in this room right now, I know that this is a God moment. I can sense his presence right here, right now. And that the Lord is speaking and moving and he's, like you're frustrated, you know? I can get, I get, I feel that. I'm frustrated. It's not, this is not what I wanted out of my life. It's not exactly how I thought things should be going. That's all right. All of that is what causes us to be God aware. You're God aware right now because your way is not working. This is right where God wants you to be. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. This is a weak moment. This is a weak area. But God is strong and available and willing to help and heal and renew your heart, your mind, and your relationships. So right now, you hear me. This is your moment. It's time for you to surrender to Jesus Christ, to make him Lord of your life, to quit saying, yes, I go to church, but to say, no, I serve Jesus. I am, I am not, I am not uh, trying this on. This is my life. I've given my whole life to him. So in this next moment, I'm gonna invite you with everybody in this room to turn toward him in faith and dedicate your life to Jesus Christ.